Namaste. I, on my personal behalf, as well as on behalf of my institute, extend a warm welcome to the speaker of today's lecture, Professor Gautam Singh, and also to all my colleagues and friends who have joined as participants in this uh, participant of this lecture through Microsoft Teams. Let me have the honor of introducing the speaker today. Professor Gautam Sen had his PhD in economics from London and was one of the creators of the graduate program in international political economy at the London School of Economics and Political Science, where he taught for over two decades as director and lecturer in the Masters in Politics of the world economy. Dr. Sain was a go-to advisor to uh, Prime Ministers Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee of India and Sri Sher Bahadur Deva of Nepal. He has also been a senior consultant with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and the United Nations Development Program. Dr. Sain has lectured to NATO officers in Brussels and high-ranking officers at the Royal College of Defence Studies, London. He was appointed to the Eminent Persons Group of the Indo-UK Roundtable in 2001 by the then Prime Minister, late Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Dr. Sain has published extensively. He is co-author of Analyzing the Global Political Economy, Princeton University, Press 2009. He is currently co-authoring a book for Simon Schuster Publishers on India's economic reforms. And if I may add on my uh, from my personal side, uh, besides being a scholar of international repute and uh, a very fervent writer, he also takes keen interest in grooming young scholars. For very recently, he wrote the generous foreword for the book authored by uh, Sri J. Sai Deepak, uh, advocate in the Supreme Court of our country. So with that, with those few words of introduction, may I now request uh, Professor Gautam Singh to lecture us on the topic, Paramount Importance of the Integrity of the Indian State for the Survival of the Nation. Over to you, sir. Namaste and Pranam to you, all. I am extremely honored to be present before you this afternoon in Benares, Varanasi, the city where I was born. My father was a graduate of BHU in 1942 when Sabrapilli Radhakrishnan was the vice chancellor. You are indeed very privileged to be living in a city which is represented by one of the greats of India today, probably one of the true builders of modern India in the 21st century. I am, of course, doubly honored to be in the company of you all in the university established by Bharat Ratna Mananya Sri Madan Mohan Malviya one of the creators of the India we live in today. I was reminded that on the date of his birth in 1861, he was followed very shortly by the great Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore. And within two years, the divine saint Swami Vivekananda was also born. And perhaps it's worth mentioning one of the greatest literary works in the history of India ever written by Michael Madhusudan Dutt. Meghdut Bhat Meghdut Kabbo was written in 1861. So the 1860s were an extremely important time for the founding of the India, which is becoming today. So I thank you all for inviting me to this great city the city, the temple city, and 
the venue which will surely have one of the greatest universities and centers of learning anywhere in the world. It is in the making. So I wish you all well. <laughs> Today, I want to talk to you about the issue of state formation, which many perhaps find a slightly arcane topic. But um, in fact, state formation is a critical component of human society. Unfortunately, in India, this is an issue which is not much discussed in public discourse and political life is excessively focused on how the state should function within. In fact, I would argue uh, over many years of research and reading that the discourse in India of the nature of the Indian state has been preempted by academics and public intellectuals who are directly influenced by adversaries seeking to undermine the functioning of the state. And let me give you a quick example before I proceed. So I, I, what I'm saying is given flesh. People are much more concerned about the ongoing farmers dispute about the threat to India's physical security on both the Western and Northern borders. This is an illustration of the false consciousness of the Indian public discourse. So we have in India become focused on process rather than institutional structures. Issues like democracy, human rights and minorities, gender and caste dominate at the expense of the VAB. Uh, Professor Sain, I think we have lost you. Over organized society proved a necessity. So you had to have an overriding authority. In fact, this is not a matter of dispute or often forgotten. It was import digitalized political authority and eventually state to, to negotiate relations with other groups to ensure the self-preservation of the people within the state. One dimension, of course, is the dimension of how to govern the relations between members living within that society and governed by the particular state. And one of the questions which arose immediately and continues to be uh, an issue after so many thousands of years is the rules of succession. How do you create in the long term the perpetuation of political authority? Uh, much of this ended up as a monarchical form over thousands of years. And I'm reminded of one distinguished colleague of mine also adding to this issue by saying one of the reasons hereditary monarchs were chosen to rule <coughs> eventually was to prevent the sitting monarch from depreciating the coinage. <laughs> because his successors would inherit. Now, centralized bureaucratic states have been the norm in pre-modern and pre-democratic eras. The modern state tends to be more decentralized and less subject to strong central direction. But as I repeat, now and later again, the principal rationale the dynamics of state and history has been coping with external threats. I think that ought to be completely clear, and I will come to this more specifically later on. The domestic governance society, the other aspect of the role of the state, has an important role, but as I said, the external issue is the key. Two 19th century theorists, Max Weber and Hintz, argue the state must be considered as more than the government. It is a continuous administrative, legal, 
bureaucratic and coercive systems that not only structure relationships between civil society and public authority in a polity, but also structure many crucial relationships within civil society as well. <laughs> the crucial issue which must, must arise and always important to bear in mind that the state as an institution must enjoy autonomy from society. That is, it must always be able to act independently of society. So there must be a distance between state and society. The state cannot be collapsed into society in the name of democracy. The one ideological alternative to this interpretation was the Marxist one, who actually behave, have always believed that the state is entirely society-centered, which means it is class-driven. In more recent times, the so-called new Marxists have granted that the state has some autonomy and various issues play a role. Now, in practical terms, what does it mean for the state to be autonomous? It cannot be synonymous with the dominant landed commercial or industrial class. It cannot be at the beck and call of those who are powerful. Mr. Mukesh Ambani and Abani's cannot tell the state at every stage what should happen. That is indeed the case in India as it is with any other society. The autonomy of the state as a body can be embedded in the corporate group within a state, able to exercise exclusionary political power and possessing ideological aspects. That is, they can exclude people from having an impact on what the state does and the Office bearer of the state will usually have ideological aspirations specific to their role. Sometimes we call this the deep state. In many specific historical circumstances, su such an elite within the state has occurred due to contingent issues, that is perception of crisis, social disorder, and of course, the more general aspiration for socio-economic development and its consolidation. So there are particular circumstances when the state and its elites assert their autonomy. The experience, of course, varies between state, but it has common features. To give you a more concrete historical example, such a dynamically autonomous bureaucracies and military officials seizing power from above to reorganizing society and possess, dispossess dominant classes. So sometimes there are groups who will seize power and guide and force the state in a particular direction. The examples are the 1868 Meiji Restoration, when the country was threatened by the West and Colonel Perry's ships demanded access to Japan, and the elites of Japan took fright from the Meiji Restoration, asserting the dominance of the elite occurred to protect the state. A similar phenomenon happened when the Caliphate was abolished in Turkey with Kemal Ataturk. Other examples include what happened in Prussia, that is the dominant part of Germany between 1806 and 1814, Russia in the 1860s, and indeed much later, Brazil in 1964. This is all examples of dominant classes taking over to guide the state in a situation of crisis. So the key remember is an autonomous state governing internally as well, but often responding to external threats to guide the state in a way which is not what exactly the elites would demand, though the elites may also agree. Other examples, that have been shown by a number of scholars is often civil servants play an important role in developing social policy, much more important than societal groups and NGOs, as we call them in India. But they end up having a decisive role 
greater than that of the political parties. And we can see this in the formulation of British and Swedish social policy where the civil servants played a role. And they have their administrative expertise, information resources, analysis, and the ability to formulate change from a superior stance and standpoint. I should mention in passing a slight contrast with the United States, which did not have the historical precedent of a centralized bureaucracy when it was formed, and did not and does not have career civil servants who continue over an entire generation like many European countries, and indeed India too, with its IAS and IFS. But even here, the state is not synonymous with society, and the scholar Stephen Krasner has shown that on many foreign policy and foreign investment guidelines, the US state, State Department, had an overriding influence in dictating policy. This state, in order to be the state, must have coercive powers, as I'm sure we know, even in India, and control over the population in a crisis. This, of course, as I will discuss, is somewhat weak in India. And they must have sufficient financial resources. For example, the British were able to fight the French from the 1780s onwards because they were able to use national debt as an instrument before anybody else. This is also the reason why the state will often seek to accumulate capital and support, in effect, what we call capitalism, because successful capitalist growth creates resources for the state. One critical dimension, which in India is simply not understood and has not been, except for some great people like Maharishi Aurobindo and a few other political thinkers and philosophers, how do you create the perceptual universe of a population to make it loyal to the state? If you look at fourth and fifth century Rome, this was a period of transition from polytheism to the primacy of Christianity, which really actually happens in the sixth century, though by 475 AD, the Roman state had, 476 AD, the Roman state had collapsed. Christianity became the ideology of the state to replace polytheism. There were many internal disputes. These disputes are not about the divine, and who has a true connection with God? It was about politics. Ultimately, the Catholics and the ideas of Augustine triumphed, but there are many other Christian alternatives which are simply cast aside, pushed aside. Indeed, political power was used to destroy them. The Donatists, for example, the Arians, the Pelagians, they were all other Christian groups. I will just say one tiny thing about the triumph of the ideas of Augustine and his successors. Augustine did not try to attack the nobility and the rich. He did not call for their destruction. He told them to be charitable, to give, especially to the church, but to give. But he did not call for them to be destroyed, as some of the others were doing, the Pelagians, for example. So if you attack the most powerful class in your society, you are liable to suffer setback. That is why the Augustinian view of Catholicism triumphed. Of course, there were others who were more radical before him, St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, but that was the key. Religious faith has been an absolutely critical dimension for European societies, as it has been for Islam. And in the case of Britain, there's a wonderful book called Britons by a scholar who was in my college once teaching as a historian, Linda Colley. C-O-L-L-E-Y, Linda Colley Britons. We don't have time, just read the conclusion. And she shows that Protestant England used its faith as Protestants to fight Catholic France, to assert their superiority in every dimension. But religion and warfare with France was central to the formation of the British state. As an aside, I might just add this was the period in which the British nobility, the nobility that came to dominate Britain, was formed from the 1780s to the 1840s. The 
the great landed nobility, the rich nobility, came into being in numbers through agricultural wealth and intermarriage. But Christianity was a critical dimension for asserting national unity. Let me conclude this by saying war making, extraction, and capital in accumulation interact to shape European state making, according to the great scholar Charles Tilly. So now let me just quickly go through a number of historical examples. I've talked about the ideas of statehood. Let me just talk about quickly Russia, China, and the United States before I come to India. And that concerns me a great deal because I remain an Indian citizen after 51 years, almost living abroad. It was a crisis of the First World War which reformulated the Russian state. In the communist era, survival of the regime assumed paramount importance until it collapsed in 1991, 70 years later. Forget about Stalin's cruelty, forget about communist ideology, forget about planning. These were subsidiary to the survival of regime and the Russian state. 30 countries attacked the Soviet Union in 1921 during the Civil War, which was fought and won by Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin as the two key leaders. The five-year plan which began in 1920 in Russia actually were partly motivated by what he saw was rapid capital accumulation to secure Russia. Yes, it was about class warfare, destroying the uh, private ownership of capital. All of that was there. He was very ideological, Joseph Stalin. But capital accumulation was a critical dimension. And the paradox is that the three five-year plans, which were extremely costly in terms of human life, waste of resources, proved critical for the survival of Russia during the Second World War. Russia would not have survived without the five-year plans. For example, the Ural Kuznets rail line on which many of the industries were moved deep into Russia. Not very effectively, but it was moved. Basically, Russia never survived the warfare against it from 1921. It was continuing, and they were always preparing. And by 1945, the, uh, the damage Russia suffered, Soviet Union suffered, is simply mind boggling. They lost 35, 40 million people. And even that figure is not clear. They lost pretty much everything they had built, the industry, everything. And that Russia never really recovered. And I should add in passing, the United States recruited all the Nazi generals to organize to fight Russia in the Cold War. There is now huge literature. And please do not believe anything you read by British scholars on the Second World War. They are full of lies and lies and lies. There are very few scholars who have written honestly about that in Britain, very, very few. And amongst the Americans, there is only one who is the most important scholar, Glantz, G-L-A-N-T-Z. He has written about 40 books. And his books on the war are worth reading. The Russians fought a war which has never been fought in human history. But you know, it left them disabled and they eventually collapsed because they could not compete with the West in terms of economic growth. And there was what we call entropy. The society had diminished. The US, after 1991, when the Russian system collapsed, tried to seize Russia by helping people like Bo uh, Boris Yeltsin to gain power. And basically, Putin put a stop to it. Putin put a stop to it, but Russia has never recovered, and the United States continues to wage war against Russia in order to bend Russia to its will, which the Russian leadership is not willing to accept. So that story carries on. But of course, Russia is much weaker. It has withdrawn from Eastern Europe, but it remains militarily quite strong. But the Russian state built in 21, the new state, is gone. External challenge, devastation within meant that they could not survive. Let me come to China quickly.
I think North should be. have suffered almost as much as the Russian people in the 20th century. The scale of the disasters, <coughs> the civil war, the Japanese occupation, absolute horrors of Japanese occupation, and then the horrors of communist rule, which continue today, to this day. Anyway, Chinese communists were basically patriots. Ultimately, they were nationalists. They look back to the great era of China's primacy, the Tang Dynasty, and they remembered the 19th century humiliations. And of course, the Japanese occupation, that was the motive force. This is what they used to crush separatism within China. And the Chinese Communist Party has always exercised a monopoly of force. And that diminished in 1976 with the death of Mao and a new pragmatic group which seized power by a political coup an economic advance became the mantra and the rationale for justifying the Communist Party. And China began an extraordinary period of growth which has never been equaled in human history from 1990 onwards. But the use of force has been central. And the Chinese state instituted from the beginning unprecedented ideological control over its people. It had begun to diminish somewhat in the 1990s and the early 20th century. While you are on the internet, if you see a hostile remark about China and you put a dislike, that is automatically noted against your account. If you put like, that is noted. If you say nothing, that is also noted. And what happens to you? One day you go to the train station to buy a train ticket and you are denied. Because this has data has been collected and you have been deemed undesirable. This is the kind of control. And they have incredible forests of cameras in cities to do AI, artificial learning. They can predict from a distance when a crowd might get violent. They can predict your emotion. AI is coming, and China is number one in the world today. A German writer called Kai Street Matter. Kai Street Matter has written a very good thin book about all these issues, about how the Chinese Communist Party exercised control. The one thing about China we must bear in mind is what is happening now. It seems to me what is happening now is very similar to the Cultural Revolution, where the party and Mao's desire for control dictated the Cultural Revolution. Now, Z is doing something similar to destroy any threats to his power from the growth of private industry, private wealth. Um, the great IT companies have all been uh, brought to heel. And now the real estate crisis. Now, this will be China's Achilles heel. I will not speak about that. But China is going to a period of great change in the Chinese state led by the Communist Party is not completely secure. China remains a country dominated by regional sentiment. And it's not just Tibet. Let me now come to the third example, the United States. The primacy of the United States was already clear by the 1890s. By the First World War, they were number one because the two, the three countries which were challengers, the four countries, France, Britain, Germany, Russia, were out of the game. The US leadership was completely con confirmed after the Second World War. But the US adopted warfare and control as the major means to ensure its own dominance. And anybody who did not agree with this became a target. The historian Iqbal Singh, who's the editor of the 
um, Congress Party documents, Iqbal Singh from Cambridge, one said to be something very interesting, that there were two Cold Wars after 1945. One was against Russia, the other one was against India. And I think that is a very prescient and insightful comment. But the US began to falter very quickly by the 1960s. And the economic malaise observable today of the United States goes back to the 60s. As I said, it became highly militaristic, but it had a militaristic tradition from the way it seized territory from the American Indians in the 19th century and how America was built by slave labor and the use of force, not up to the 1860s in the abolition, but you know, if you read the history of what happened to the slaves, this carried on until the 1930s, 40s and beyond. One of the drawbacks of being number one We can see you, Professor. Please continue. Are you speaking? Yeah, yeah. Please continue. Okay. Now, the US decline was to do with costly wars, the failure of domestic infrastructure. If you want to read about that, there's a very good book by Professor Graham Allison, Graham Allison of Harvard. And he's written about Sino American competition. Even if you don't have time to read the whole book, Read the first two or three chapters, which has a very useful study of the relative difference, for example, in infrastructure building in China and the United States. Now, the United States has neglected infrastructure at many levels, though it continues to dominate science and education. So the United States' position remains critical but it has enormous domestic problems. And if you look at some of the data collected, for example, things which give you an indication of what is happening to a society within, the suicides amongst young, white, working class people, the data is available on the net, it's shocking. There is something deeply wrong. And basically the collapse of family life, it is no longer as a, regarded as an institution for the viability of society. And I'm afraid this is coming to India too. Now, let me now come quickly to India. It's the third part. India has long been a fisparous nation despite a shared common civilization heritage. It's always been divided within despite having a common heritage. It was a self destructive war between the Gujar Pratiharas and Rashtrakutas of the Deccan and the Palas of the East that created the conditions for the defeat of the Gujarat Pratiharas by the Ghaznavid invaders. It is because the Northern Kingdoms had been fighting constant wars and had become weakened. East and South, they were unable to resist invasion. India actually has only enjoyed overriding unity for two centuries under British rule, which was achieved, achieved by use of force and political maneuvering and it actually did stop the constant incursions from the north, the constant incursions over a thousand years. In fact, the people in the north made a living through incursion in India. The Pushtos and all these people from the Afghanistan side, their livelihood was based on raiding into the rest of India. But that was stopped. Already it was curtailed by Maharaja Ranjit Singh and the British consolidated that. But what is happening to India, I must be very brutal because I have much respect for the regime in power today, working under great constraints. But important segments of Indian society and polity has been seized by a criminal entrepreneurial class, which has little loyalty to the idea of the Indian nation. I think you will know what I'm talking about. There are contrasts, most of all, in the state where you live in where the ability and the 
desire to build a nation is absolutely palpable for the first time in two, three hundred years. But the primacy of the federal structure of India is increasingly being challenged by many, many parties across the east, the north, local disputes in which there is a huge foreign presence. Believe you me, I've studied this over a lifetime. I have great familiarity with literature, much of which is not actually available on the internet. There is huge interference in India from abroad, absolutely huge. So when the, uh, the chief minister of Karnataka says this and he's criticized, he's actually simply speaking the truth. What India has lost in my view, and I lament this and I've lamented this for 30 years, it has lost control over the critical narrative of its nationhood. No other country has allowed its national narrative to be seized from abroad. And this is going to become a hundred times worse. Believe you me, I repeat a hundred times worse because AI and quantum computing will track everything from the cup of tea you drink in the morning to what upset you in the afternoon. This will be known to people outside and they will know which buttons to press, how to manipulate you. India must start a mission like ISRO in AI, in artificial intelligence. This is of the greatest importance. I noticed one family spent 100 million pounds on their daughter's wedding. Please, we need to spend money on this AI revolution. We have the skill. But our skilled people are helping other people to do this abroad. Some of them are working for Chinese companies owned in the United States, Indians, clever Indians. India is also suffering considerable stress on its borders. And there is complex demographic transformation in the East, Northeast, which in my view is unstoppable. I think the East and parts of Northeast, I'm afraid, are probably lost within a democratic India. Another worry which people have started to use against India. I notice a Bengali gentleman has been using this sitting in Singapore that the divergent growth rates of Indian states is a potential source of trouble. Successful states will start asking, and they're doing it now, but why should we pay into the national budget which goes to the weaker states? This is a calamity and foreigners have understood this is a weak spot for India. Many individual states are also now saying, are asserting quasi autonomy. I've heard the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, Chief Minister of West Bengal, virtually asserting autonomy as a state. This may only be a straw in the wind, but it is a source of great worry because we do not control our national narrative, what makes us one people. And then we have very inadequate, unsuitable constitutional arrangements that are preventing essential tasks from being performed. One of the biggest problems in India will be the Supreme Court, I'm afraid to say to you. You know, in implementing the constitution according to its own lights, it will be unable to perceive the grave dangers to the unity and survival of India. Our constitutional order itself will become an issue. So India, in my view, is an endangered and weak polity. And a weak federal authority is the worst thing which can happen to India. You and I sitting in one part of India may have grudges against the center. That is fine. We do not like the center. But believe you me, without a strong federal authority, India is finished. India is a country with huge legislative prowess. They are very good at legislating, but they are very poor at implementation. We have everything on our legislative books, but enforcement is lacking. Just one critical area I mentioned, which is so bad for the economy. I'm arguing this for a long time with anybody who will listen. The inability to to enforce contracts. This is a huge cost to private enterprise. This is changing. I see some very positive signs in Lucknow that there is now awareness of this and there is action taking place. I am so happy to see that. And, but 
While this persists, it creates a sense of political illegitimacy for the governing classes. This is not a good thing. We may have dislikes for the political class at the center, but weakening the center is a grievous mistake. So we have a problem of external threats now and domestic fissure, fissures, which our enemies are using against us. Let me finish by at least saying a few things on an optimistic note. Despite the Indian polity being beset by significant dangers, it does have advantages which are available to a modern state that was absent in the past. Most importantly, its security forces, standing army and armed forces being deployed to cope with challenges within the country and its borders. These are intact. These are of high quality. And I am forever impressed when I meet senior officers and I am on the board of a company with two generals. I always ask them, are there still people like you serving in the Indian Armed Forces to the retired generals? And they say to me, yes. This is a very big plus plus for India, our armed forces. They are sacred. They are the people who stopped our invasions, which carried on for a thousand years. First, under the guise of the East Indian Company and Maharaja Ranjit Singh's armies, then the Indian National Army. A centralized bureaucracy also exists, which reaches to the furthest corners of the Indian polity. I have many criticisms of the bureaucracy, I will hasten to add, but they at least give the center, the federal structure, reach. Important. So do not throw the baby out with the bathwater because you are critical of the bureaucracy. We also have advanced transportation and communications unavailable in the past, and that is getting better by the day. And I'm so encouraged every time I see our outstanding Minister Nitin Gatkari presiding over this. And by all accounts, he is effective and it is happening. Unfortunately, the fruits of this will be felt in the future, not immediately. It takes time for this to unfold. For me, the biggest plus plus in India is that India will become a very urbanized society. By 2030, 600 million people will be living in cities. These people in cities have a national identity. They leave behind caste, region, language. What these people in the cities want is a decent governance, and their parochial sentiments are weakening. This is the constituency for any nationalist party, the 600 million people plus. I would like to mention one name, which I thought I wouldn't, of a person who is played an important role in inspiring and encouraging this new urbanites of India. This is the novelist Amish Tripathi. Many are reading his books and they feel affirmed and confident because of what he writes. I was telling Amish, you have no idea what a great contribution you're making to modern India. And there are others were doing the same. But because his book sells by the millions, I am very encouraged. So this India has many strengths, many weaknesses. So historically, international order and character of the constituency has never been unchanging and competitive struggles have altered the system. Uh, Russia went, Britain went, the Romans had gone earlier. Authority and coercion are very important. The contemporary international order is in a state of flux. Serious Sino-US de uh, tensions will prevail. I do not think the Russia, the Chinese and the Americans are going to go to war. The cost to each of them will be far too high. So they may leave us holding the baby. We may find that at a critical moment we are alone. I feel from my reading of our government in Delhi today, they are all aware of the challenges. India is a very difficult country to govern. And I think I don't have to repeat this to you. You must know, sitting in UP in Benares, but great efforts are being built to create the infrastructure and polity of India, to create a more unified nation. And in this one day, the narrative will have to be introduced in a big way. And I hope BHU will be true to the legacy of the great Madan Mohan Malviya and play a leading role and become one of the great centers of learning, of our ancient learning, of our Vedic past. I hope I live long enough to see this because I want to end my final days in your city, 
along the branches of the Ganga near the abode of the Lord Shiva. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you very much, Professor Singh. That was a very scintillating lecture. And without mincing words, wherever you had offered your critical insights about the, uh, the policies concerning the state. I now have the floor open for questions and interactions from the attendees. I request that uh, you may express your interest to ask a question by writing, or uh, you can just unmute yourself and introduce yourself first and then ask the question. I request you to keep the questions quite brief and crisp. I mean, if you can raise your hands, I can call out the names. Dr. Ranjir Singh, do you want to ask? Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Sir, thank you very much. It was indeed a very very nice perspective I got from your lecture today. So I have just one question, which is about caste censors, which is center is denying to do, whereas many of the states are demanding caste censors. I mean, I mean, Chief Minister of Bihar, I believe, demanded caste uh, censors. Sorry, Dr. Ranjir Singh, could you please kindly introduce yourself and uh, have the question uh, aligned with the topic for the, for what was presented? Yes, so this national policy, I mean... Uh, can you please introduce yourself first and then go ahead with the question. I'm faculty at the Department of the Metallurgical Engineering, sir. Yeah, okay. And uh, my question is about the caste census uh, with regard to Indian integrity thing. Center is denying to do it, whereas some states are saying that it should be done. What's your take? Whether it should be done or not? I think the center is absolutely right to resist. Whether they will succeed is another matter. Caste, as we know it today, is pure invention. It was an invention which gathered momentum in the first census of 1871. It has been used to divide Indians from each other. Even the left-wing people who write about caste, even they admit that what we have today has no precedent in Indian history. And basically, caste is a weapon to interfere into our society. Everybody doing a PhD in Oxford and Cambridge in India studies departments, half of them are doing work on caste. They want to cultivate, keep this alive. They want to divide us, and caste is a, has proved a very effective weapon, except the UP Adityanath overcame that. This is why they want to kill, revive caste as much as possible, because many Indians, as I said, urban Indians, are not looking to caste. They are looking for good governance and good values. And so the government is absolutely right to refuse, uh, but I'm, I'm afraid the caste constituency is very powerful. I don't know if they will succeed. I pray they do. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, Sudhir Babu Patel, could you please introduce yourself first and then go with the question? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I am Sudhir Babu Patel, a research scholar in Civil Engineering Department, IIT BHU. Sir, uh, I want to know the uh, name of book of which uh, you told that uh, good book on artificial intelligence and uh, working of China on that. So please repeat the name so that I can uh, write and purchase that book. Um, you know, the one I mentioned is not about AI, but the use of AI in China. The author's name is Kai, K-A-I. And yes, the surname of the author is Street Matter, S-T-R-I-T-T. -T M A T E R. I will send it to Professor Ramanathan at the end of this lecture. I will send him the exact title of the book. It's a paperback. It's very well written. If you want to read more generally about AI, you could just read the book recently by Raji Malhotra. Because Raji Malhotra has written about AI, and there's scores of videos, one including me, of discussion on AI with Raji Malhotra and 
other Indian scholars and Indian generals. Rajiv Malhotra, artificial intelligence, just do a Google. There are many good discussions, but his book is also very good. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Thank you, Singh. Do you have another question? I see your hand still raised. Dr. Ranthir Singh? No, sir. No, I'll end Okay, it. fine. Okay. I uh, take the privilege of being the uh, convener and I have, I have a couple of questions. So, may I? Um, I mean, uh, first a comment that the civil servants play a major role that you made. It quickly brought in my mind the livid scenes of Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, the British sitcom which had made a, a, a money out of portraying this exact sentiment that you had expressed. Uh, my question is now, like when you say the state must have autonomy of the society, uh, where do you see the, the location or the locus of media or journalism here? You see, in India, uh, the media by and large is compromised by association with specific political parties. Even the media which, in fact, I don't watch the media at all, hardly I watch. Even the media which is sympathetic to the government, which I agree with, is really a mouthpiece. So that, that, that happens in every society to some degree, but in our case, it is very blatant. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't care. I'm not concerned about the media's autonomy. I'm really not concerned. Because in India, no government is so powerful that they can do what they please. Our governments have many constraints placed on them. I'm actually interested in something very specific and narrow at this juncture in the history of India. How quickly is India building its economic infrastructure? That's a very critical dimension. And I think what is happening now is of significance, of great significance. And for this alone, I will always be on the side of the federal government what they're trying to do. I can say there are mistakes here and there. I can say there's something else I would like. The only thing I say to them, which is not really happening, I think it really is urgent, is to take a knife, root and branch to the narrative which is being propagated, propagated in our schools and universities, which are preaching division in the name of human rights, gender, caste. We can't afford this because I remind you of what the Pakistani army did in Bangladesh when they entered. This is a recent history, not Roman times, not German times, not the Second World War. They killed every single Hindu they could fight. Uh, women were kept in camps. If it enters northern India, believe you me, many of these things will happen. So we have to make sure the integrity of our economy, our society remains. Many other things, are, I am the first to criticize my country, but I only will do so with my fellow countrymen, not a book. This is a private discussion. So I would say the media is not that important. I am only say, you know, we have 10, 15, 20 years of critical change when we need peace and economic transformation. And no matter what you say about Narendra Damodar Modi, he is trying harder than anybody I can think in the last 200 years. Nobody has tried as hard and I said to myself when he became prime minister, it reminded me of the coronation of Chhatrapati Maharaj Shivaji. I stick with that today. And he will be one of the true greats, if not the greatest, if he survives another decade in our history. And I pray for his well-being. I truly pray for his well-being. That's very uh, uh, promising to hear these words from you. My other question is, uh, is a follow-up of this, what you said that you are most interested in seeing the Indian economic infrastructure getting strengthened. Uh, now, how do you see this inroad of the cryptocurrency? How do you, according to you, from your viewpoint, how do you see that when it makes its inroad in our, in our country? You know, Jamie Dimon, the head of uh, JP Morgan, today said, even if he thought the value would go up 10 times, he wouldn't touch it. So cryptocurrency is a problem. For India, while it has capital controls, <coughs> cryptocurrency will become a source of leakage. While it has. That is why China is now delegitimizing cryptocurrency. It has just done that in the one week because cryptocurrency is being used for capital flight. The same will happen in India. 
so I, I'm not in favor of cryptocurrency. I think this is a distraction. Okay. And in a way, it is a sign of the failure of the real economy. When people are going towards a cryptocurrency, it's partly because of oversupply of dollars, because of the huge QE printing, people taking a refuge, which may turn out to be not a refuge, by the way. So our economic failures are expressed in two dimensions, the, the cost of real estate and the cost of gold. The ratio of the, the rental ratio in India is very high compared to the rest of the world. The price of gold is higher than the rest of the world. This is a sign of the fact that people don't have confidence to invest in real productive assets. And we have not overcome that. I'm sorry to say doing business in India is still very difficult. We have made big strides in some parts, but it is still difficult. Okay. And that is what we must overcome. That's a brilliant answer. My last question. Uh, it's about this Japanese colonization over China. And you have rightly expressed the kind of horrific treatment that the Chinese had in the hands of Japanese. But then on a personal note, uh, how do we reconcile with the verdict given by Radha Vinod Pan, who is kind of a god celebrated in Japan? You know, uh, if you read about the crimes that were committed by the uh, Japanese in China, in Manchuria, Shanghai. There's a book on this called The Devil's Gluttony. If you read that, you will not sleep for well. But that Japan and this Japan are different. The Japan we have today has left behind that past. And in our great Hindu tradition, we must always practice forgiveness and brotherhood. And that Japan, that is the Japan of today, is very important for us. So Japan's friendship and relationship with us is very critically important. Because Japan and our two economies match. They have human capital, but they do not have raw materials. We have market size, so there are many uh, areas of convergence. So Japan, Korea, Taiwan are our friends. Israel, all these smaller economies who have mostly market size problems, not Japan so much. And we have huge manpower, um, which needs better training. Our manpower is not as well trained. We have pockets of excellence, but not across the board. Okay. So we should collaborate with Japan very much. And I'm glad to see we're doing so with Australia too. Small country with a lot of potential. That's I have to congratulate actually the new Indian government. I had never dreamt that Narendra Modi was such a skilled practitioner of international politics. Since his coming to power, India has done things which were actually very hard to imagine. And now we have an outstanding external affairs minister and our NSA to make this a reality. So I'm optimistic because I particularly think Jayashan Panji is exceptionally gifted and capable. That's nice. Dr. Pawan, uh, please unmute yourself and ask. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pawan. Uh, thank you, Professor Gautam, for this uh, interesting uh, talk. Uh, so uh, I have a question regarding the bureaucracy. Dr. Pawan, please introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm Pawan from I'm Pawan from physics department. Uh, I have a question regarding the bureaucracy that was mentioned uh, rather briefly. So uh, with I mean many attribute many um, uh, many of the ills that plagues India still to the bureaucracy. Uh, I mean collector still stands for is derived from the word. Uh, from the British era who collects tax for in a particular district. So how do you see, I mean, you said that this is too early and we should not be really trying to change the system, if I may paraphrase. So uh, so what kind of system do you envisage if at all there is going to be any transition and how do you, and when do you see that happening? You know, I, no, I didn't say leave the system intact. I mean, I may have uh, not been clear on that. No, uh, Actually, the system, system is changing in a way which uh, is not co completely visible. Insofar as the Indian state's reach and activities are shrinking, the bureaucracy's reach is also shrinking. The more of the economy that's under private initiative, the less the role of the bureaucracy. That is what will cure the bureaucracy. What the bureaucracy needs to do is to do a few things well rather than many things badly, which is what used to be the case. Hmm. This is going to change because the government's control of the economy and society is shrinking. You know, that's a good thing. This is the, the future of India. Our Sadharan Samaj, 
are ordinary people will run their own lives. We will use our own traditions, local traditions, our local dharma, our local forms of living to manage. That will be the great diversity, and the bureaucracy will not be have, have so much control. I just want to finish by on this by saying one thing. I have many friends among senior bureaucrats, many good bureaucrats, many effective bureaucrats. So I am not painting everybody with the same brush. I have met many outstanding foreign service officers, many outstanding people in the PMO. Currently, some of the finest people are working in the PMO that I know of. So I don't uh, take a blanket approach. But I think in general, a society run by bureaucracy is not a good thing. And that is shrinking, perhaps not as quickly as I would wish. And what is the kind of uh, system that will take over the, uh, I mean, in for, as, the, as the executive, so to say? You know, we will always have a national bureaucracy because of the size of our country and the need for the government's reach. But you know, it, it really will have fewer things to do. That is the only cure. They will have fewer things to do. They will manage fewer things. I look forward to autonomous universities. I've seen how Indian universities are impacted by bureaucratic decisions. All of this should be fast. There will be mistakes made because they're independent and autonomous, but these are things we have to do, especially to withdraw from running our mandirs. They should be completely out of this. We have to create an alternative. Now, this will be the biggest change in India in generations, that we will run our own affairs without a bureaucrat and the government telling us how we will do it. We will make our mistakes and we will be learning all the time. But I have great confidence in the, in the integrity, the human integrity of ordinary Indians and that we will manage and the bureaucracy will not be dictating to us. It is still and doing that, I'm afraid. It is still doing that. <laughs> sir, can, uh, Ramananda, can I ask one follow up question? Yeah, quickly. Uh, yeah. Running out so, of time. Uh, yeah. Sure. So, uh, in your experience, experience so far, uh, whomever you have met in the bureaucracy. So how many do you see as specialists and generalists? Because, for example, in situations like in regarding things like AI or maybe any of the emerging technologies, cyber security, etc. So we need specialists and their inputs rather than some generalists uh, who are primarily about administration. Uh, you know, this, so, is a, this, is, this, is, this is a problem. This is a this is a big problem in India. The journalists are not able, and also, you know, the, the shortness of time they spend in any one post. I've often noticed okay. that they have moved on and they have lost interest one year before being moved on because they will not see the outcome. Many of my friends who want to work for India and who are working from other countries who deal with the bureaucracy says every two years a new person comes. So their commitment is lacking and they're generalists. So, you know, this system must change. There is now some evidence of lateral entry. We need more experts. There is lateral entry taking place, but it's very difficult to change this huge structure which is so deeply embedded. But the government is making some efforts. You see, yes, we need area specialists. You see. And AI is a good example. But you know, if we, we can do it through ISRO, which the government undertaking, we can do it elsewhere too. And there is some effort. There is collaboration, for example, in semiconductors, which failed, unfortunately, due to that fire in 1989, that fire which destroyed our AI efforts, ISRO, Bombay, Delhi were all cooperating. We need better structures. The one small thing I would recommend to any government is that those private individuals from other organizations who are coming in must be given legally enforceable intellectual property rights. So if some BHU engineer is making a contribution, they must be given legally enforceable intellectual property rights. And this should not devolve automatically to the organization or to the government. We must motivate people. This mm -hmm. is lacking in India. See? And I, I, I hope this will change. But intellectual property rights must reside. Okay, if your department does it, let them keep 30%, but 10, 15% must go to the individual contributor to the work. That, that I see is the the entry I would like to agency. see. That I see in the funding agency uh, clauses or guidelines where if there is any patent, it goes to the funding agency, not with the individual. But yeah, oh, but this I, I can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, this thank you, much thank you. Because don't motivate people. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank Paul. you very much, Professor. Uh, last question of the lecture by Nikita Mittal. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. 
Yes, good evening, sir. I am Nikita Mittal. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Humanistic Studies. Sir, my question is like you talked about how caste divided Indians, and it was a concept brought by the colonizers. And the the present government is actually representing India as a unifying nation finally after so many years. But sir, if we see locally, the the narrative of caste division or the narrative of especially Hindu Muslim has increased. in the tenure of this government so why there is such a disparity in a local india and the india on a global level uh, if i may intervene i think the question is loaded with certain assumptions so it's your prerogative professor saint whether to answer it or not no 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 i i i no i i think you know uh, you, you have identified a, a serious problem you know i'm afraid our caste consciousness is very deep and many of our personal family and community interests are embedded in caste in a society where a lot of the distributed goods or benefits are in short supply you want to use identity politics to get your share this is partly a consequence of the fact that identity is very important for making your way in this society for navigating if you go your jab bhai and say mere liye karo ame to bhot dunga mera parivar mera community that is an effective way of making a plea once we dissolve this and you don't need this kind of loyalty to get ahead in our society once we are vibrant as an economy as a society we are living in cities we are more bothered about water supply we are more bothered about clean roads this consciousness will diminish it is a bit of a monster this monster is a creation of the british and before them the portuguese in fact you know bala gangadhara from ghent and my colleague from london prakasha have been saying there is no such thing as caste you know i have understood why they say that i don't agree with them 100% but i understand why they saying that. this concept of caste you see social hierarchy and power is connected to wealth the upper caste particularly the brahmins did not have wealth they had ideological power you may say they misused it if you separate wealth from political power this is a different kind of situation altogether you see in a way this was the view of plato there will be an elite driven by the life of the mind to guide society but will have not much wealth you know but you know thousand years of occupation mass killings of this class their memory their practices there was carnage for too long too many of them died and they have turned against themselves all my brahmin friends teaching in columbia chicago harvard they are the most anti indian they are the ones who most call for the destruction of india as we know it they are pretty happy for india to split into many pieces these are people i grew up with so yes caste is a very important weapon i think it will take time um reservations are unavoidable because without reservations you will have a growth in maoism they would all join the naxalite movement but reservations have also created their its own problems so we have to navigate this great difficulty which is why it will take time the one little thing i would do which has not been done in india properly is make sure that primary and secondary education is of a quality which helps people at the bottom to rise no point having reservations in medical school and engineering we are failing the many at the bottom we give reservations to top because that is politically effective but we have to spend the money and make the effort and we can do it because for the same per capita spending on schooling in tamil nadu you get better outcomes than you get in up or bihar so we have to address this area of high quality schooling where the talent and gifted of every community the tickle that is part which regardless of caste will have the opportunity to advance and this is where we are failing uh thank you nikita do you have a follow up question because i see your hand still raised uh, are you done no no sir i'm i'm done thank you thank you uh, with that we come to a close of today's lecture and i profusely thank on my behalf and behalf of my institute to professor sain for having spontaneously agreed to our request to come and address us and we have had the pleasure of listening to him 
his incisive insights about the current uh, ongoings with respect to the polity as well as the economy. On the final note that we need to invest more in the primary and secondary education, uh, we are indeed marching uh, in that direction, if I may say so, by looking at even a cursory glance to the national education policy that has uh, come out and with the recent formation of the national curriculum framework as well, we see better days ahead, uh, if not worse. So with those positive notes, I once again thank you, sir, for your time and uh, having lectured to us. And it's a delight, delight to note that Banaras has been a city of your birth. Uh, we expect to have an offline lecture with you once you, if you are visiting India anytime in the future, please uh, uh, allow our institute to be, to host you in our institute. Thank you very much, Professor Singh. And thanks one and all for attending the lecture. Thank you. Thank you.